was teal. It was teal before, but it like if you look at it under the rug, you'll see it's um, yeah. So it changes a little bit. And yeah. <laughs> so I think we're ready to begin. Are we ready to begin? All right, we're ready to begin. Um, hi, welcome to the Aperture Photo Book Club. Um, we're really glad to have you join us. I'm really glad to be joined. Uh, I'll introduce you all in a minute. First, we'll, first we'll give a little bit of more context. So Aperture was founded, in case you didn't know, Pa, <laughs> 71 years ago by a group of artists and writers and curators who really believed in photography and creating community around that, who believed in the power of words and pictures that combined with one another. And the Photo Book Club is sort of our newest way of thinking about how can we bring people into that conversation? How can we use, understand the photo book as an expression of an artist's vision, talking with uh, two artists and a designer, and how can we share that with other people so that they can thus pick up any other photo book, or any book really for that matter, and get something new out of it. So today, we're talking about Pa Waher's My Grandfather Turned Into a Tiger and Other Illusions. And I'm very, very happy to be joined by Jill Weinstock, the executive director of Baxter Street at the Camera Club of New York, um, where Pa's exhibition is now on view, Run, Don't Walk. Um, by Pa, who will tell us all about this book in a minute. We'll come back to you, our honored guest. By Alex Lynn of Studio Lynn, who designed this incredible book. So thank you, Alex. We're looking forward to chatting with you. And Tommy Ka, who was the winner of last year's Next Step Award. Um, and we, we can maybe segue into that, but it's also a dear friend. So we'll, we'll get into all of that. Um, I do want to thank our sponsors because they are what make it possible for us to turn my living room into a quasi-TV studio every, uh, I don't know, a couple months. So thank you to Photo Focus for that. We really appreciate your help. And I know Jill and I would both like to thank the 7G Foundation because 7G has made possible not just this project and the exhibition, but also Tommy's and also Zora Murph's, who was featured in our very, very first photo book club ever. So um, without that, uh, without the Next Step Award, really none of this would have happened. So I think we're gonna begin, if I'm right, with a little bit of, of a flip through because we feel like it's nicer to let people know a little bit about what we're looking at. And maybe, Pa, if you would talk while people are looking at that, and then we can, then we'll jump back in. Absolutely. So, uh, my grandfather turned to a tiger, another illusion, is an accumulation of six bodies of work that spans 15 years of my practice. Um, and in chron chronological order, starting with the earliest body of work to the latest, um, attention, my mother's flowers, my grandfather turned into a tiger, after the fall of Mong Tik Cha, the imaginative landscape, and flowers of the sky. The book is an extension of the ways in which I usually go about sequencing my work, the different bodies of work, and the title draws on the story told to me about my grandfather and how he turned into a tiger. The images in the book draws on ideas of love, lust, illusion, disillusion, desire, and the construction of imagery, both literal and metaphorical. That's awesome. So we'll let people look for a little bit longer because I think the video has a few more. But if you want to say anything about what, what I, one of the things I love and anyone will notice when you pick up the book is that all of those series that you described in chronological order are really mixed up together in the book. So it's not the, the sections. Um, Alex makes it very clear. In the end, you know what you're looking at. But as you're looking through it for the first time, that's not your impression. But we'll, unless you want to, you can say anything. Else. Yeah, I mean, it's how I always envision my work to be. Um, one image informs the other, informs the other. I think also in the way in which my practice is, um, you know, I'm always going back to bodies of work that I've made in the past 
to lean on, to learn from, and then also to look into the future too. And um, this book is really um, very much the way in which I think about all my images, all the images that I've I've made, all the bodies of work that I've made. Um, they're yeah, they don't they, they I don't think about the images in these chronological chronological order. They go back and forth, and uh, there are some in the present, there are from the past. And, I, and I think that was like part of when we you know the Next Step Award, you know now it's in its third year. We have this. It, it's a it's a big moment where an artist you know you like Tommy like Zora had several bodies of work and they you really had matured and evolved and grown as an artist and I don't know Jill if you want to talk a little bit about like one of the kinds of things we're talking about as we're thinking about artists for this award yeah I mean it's an interesting process in that we had about um, 20 to 30 people nominate one or two artists, and there was a lot of crossover. There was also a lot of introductions to new work. And it became you know, clear that it was really nice to be introduced to some of these artists that maybe we weren't familiar with, but they weren't quite ready for that next step. And so it was nice to like continue to see their career develop and their studio practice. And so I think with the three artists that were chosen for this Next Step Award, had all one thing in common, which is you know a really prolific body of work that even though it looked like there were many different series or different projects, they all had common threads of um, a narrative that was running through all the work. And that was really exciting because it made it feel like there was energetic you know discourse about what the book could look like because it wasn't just, here's one body of work, this is what we want to do. And I think that that was like a really wonderful way to set that up and have that next step. And then the same with the exhibition, that really thinking about how is work seen in a space versus in, in a book. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is also very different too. And I think artists aren't necessarily um, at that point in their career where they're ready to have those conversations. And so as you can see with these three, we, we, we nailed it. <laughs> I, I think we kind of did. Um, but maybe we'll start with just the title, both of the book and then of the exhibition, which I think yeah. is, you know, the every one of the exhibitions has had a title that relates to the title of the book, but never quite so well as this one. So um, you alluded to the fact that your grandfather had turned into a tiger without further comment during the talk over. Did your grandfather actually turn into a tiger? <laughs> I believe he did, okay. yes. I mean, from all the stories that I heard, you know, um, you know, back in 2016, I visited uh, Great Aunt and it was my grandfather's youngest sister who was um, dying of cancer. And I, you know, my dad really never um, like knew my grandfather because he died very early on. And uh, my dad never talked about my grandfather and I wanted to know more about who he was, and um, and so I asked my aunt, my great aunt. I said, you know, like, who's my grandfather? Um, and she went on to tell me this really beautiful story about my grandmother and my grandfather and how they loved each other, and in the short years that they were married, had these like four sons. But when uh, General Vang Pao, who uh, you know worked with the CIA at that time uh, to uh, fight against um, the Viet Cong's um, for the American War came through my grandfather's uh, town, asked my grandfather to go fight, and he reluctantly went uh, out of a sense of obligation. And he went, and after shortly uh, he went into war, he stepped on a mine and he died. Um, and that when he died, this tiger came into my grandmother's village and stayed with my grandmother, right? Um, and it wasn't until my grandmother asked the tiger to leave that the tiger left. And so my grandmother and uh, people in the village, my great aunt, um, have always attributed my grandfather to this tiger. Um, and so when I heard this story... Because he was... But sorry, just one thing I've yeah. heard. This story, the tiger actually brought your grandmother things. Like, the yes. tiger wasn't just menacing your right. grandmother. The tiger was protecting your grandmother. Absolutely. So the tiger would go into the village and would kill the, you know, the pigs and the chickens and would drag them to my grandmother's fr the front door. I'm sure the neighbors you know, were mean, thrilled. Like, <laughs> right? I mean, so, like, there were these, like, these things that were happening that people were attributing 
to my grandfather, and it must have been my grandfather. Why would why would anybody kill anything, and why would they drag them to my grandmother's house, right? And so um, people and really, the tiger listened to your grandmother when she asked him to absolutely. leave. Absolutely, right? and so the tiger left. And uh, you know, uh, my grandmother never spoke of the tiger, and. Uh, I don't think I ever like heard the story. I think I heard the story once when I was a lot younger, and I remember asking my dad, and my dad, you know, just going, "Oh, that's just folklore, right?" Um, and so I heard the story, and I just like there was sort of there's something about the story. I think as a as a photographer, as a storyteller, I wanted to go out into the world. I knew that I was going to go to Laos. Um, later in that year too, and so I decided that I was going to go to Laos and I was going to go and like recreate the story, right? I was going to go and find a tiger and a village and my grandmother and you know these like I was going to go and recreate the story and um, yeah, I think I initially I set out to do that um, and it didn't pan out, um, <laughs> but that was the initial like what I was initially planning on doing. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's a good way maybe also to hear you talk about photography for you walks this line between illusion and reality or fact and fiction. You, you maybe want to, and then we'll, and then we'll let somebody else, maybe we'll turn it to Tommy, but I would, you know, that, that's an interesting through line, not just of this series, but of your work overall. Yeah. I mean, like, I think a lot about the idea of grief, right? And like what compels a person to assume that like an animal is the like is, is the reincarnation of your loved one right like what, what like what compels a person to do that um and i i think like i was really thinking about that you know um the idea of like love and loss and grief and then also thinking about illusion and magic, right? Uh, and like trickery and like, I was thinking about all those things and in thinking about this story about my grandfather and the way in which my grandmother and people around her believed that this was, you know, like that this really happened. Um, and so, I mean, I, I also think about w what it means as a photographer too, to like carry an object that it, like that that historically is supposed to render the truth, right? It's the, the the tool that you take that renders the, the the like the real life person of somebody or an object or a thing. And um, you know, I I'm always thinking about like that instance and then moments after and moments before. I mean, I was obviously thinking about. Dorothea Lane and the migrant mother and all the images that came before and all the images that came after migrant mother, right? And that 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 that, that image that Dorothea Lane had chosen is like a truth that is her truth that becomes the truth, right? And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think about yeah. that when I'm making photographs. And I mean, I think so. Tommy is here not because just because he won it last year. In fact, I would say first and foremost, he's here as your friend. Do you guys want to? Share how you met? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, we didn't decide which. We, we, we didn't decide if we were going to tell the truth or we were going to well, make you up a story. You can, magic, <laughs> illusion, and other illusions. You know, we were, um, uh, only the two of you will know. Yeah, Tommy and I actually met in graduate school. And um, I was a year above him. Uh, and then we interviewed him. He came and hung out with us. And uh, next year, he like he came as a, like a first year student, and we just sort of became. Oh wait, like, what did you think? What was the interview like? <laughs> Give us like, <laughs> you know what? I will say this, and I think that other people in both our classes will uh, definitely agree. Tommy Ka is like he was a star then, and he continues to be a star now. <laughs> and he, like, he is exactly, like, he is exactly who he says he is, which is, like, so amazing. Um, you know, Tommy and I became really fast friends because Tommy and I, along with our other friend, Richard Choi, were really the only Asians in our cohort uh, from the year before and the year after, and we just, continue to be friends um, after graduate school. And every time I'm in New York, I call Tommy and Richard up and 
you know, Tommy has visited me in Minnesota, and yeah, and so yeah, we we've, we've been friends since. Yeah, I mean, it was such a great experience. I was really um, terrified um, of just uh, the interview process, and I thought I I answered the first question great, and then it just um, did not last <laughs> like that for the duration, and so I like like had to get out of there and you guys just found me and like just assured me while like went out and and it felt so great and um to uh go through photography with you for Mm. um the year that we were overlapping and I think it was I don't know uh I don't know just great happenstance uh for us to still be in touch we have a text thread yeah do you want to tell them what our name is I really want to yeah, know. Yeah, I really want to know now. <laughs> oh, man, I'm kind of blanking on it. Wait, yes. it's yes. It's yes. Yes. Uh, Yale Asian Squad. It's <laughs> <laughs> a really great acronym. It is a great acronym. It is a great acronym. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's great. So, but there, your work also, there are commonalities in that. I don't, either one of you could speak to it. But this idea of tradition and community, mm-hmm. of illusion, you know, you leaning into that possibility with photography you either want you could speak to it in your own work or into one another's work landscape yeah yeah I feel like there's um the idea that we will will deal with the personal and family for sure um because history doesn't account for us right Mm -hmm. so I think it's super important to uh, go really all in into using um the biography and our own familial um archives to um I guess through photography, through the camera, it makes us these archivists, these archaeologists, these time travelers. Uh, like photography is always working with the past, and through it, and through the book, through the experience of working with y'all and Aperture and Baxter Street to um, think about the pictures in a different way, but still, <clears throat> um, the original intent of understanding our past um, through these different filters of familial and tradition and our education as well, our way of navigating through the world. Um, So I really love that we kind of share, I always think like photography is this like language because language is a a communal activity. So you need like more than one person to Mm. engage in it, right? And it's like casting a net. It's like finding people that speak in this sort of slang. Mm -hmm. Um, or dialect yeah. or um, accent even. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about like the colors in your work as yes. it relates to like the colors in my work, right? Yeah. Like just the color palette. The florals. Yeah, the florals. <laughs> um, so maybe that's a good way to segue. We have another guest here tonight <laughs> um, and his name is Alex Lin. Um, he is our first non-Aperture repeat guest on the Photo Book Club, so just, you know, Chapeau to you, Alex. But you designed this amazing thing, and there are so many great features. I oh, also designed Tommy's book. Um, so, but we're but we're tonight we're focusing on Paul. Yes, yeah. Um, well, although you can nod to whatever. Would you? How was the process for you? And how did I actually don't even know how that decision or conversation happened? Sure. Um, well, I I'm feel super grateful and lucky to work with such talented material and people as such as yourselves. Um, and being an immigrant myself, I feel like it's personal to me. Like you know, I, I moved here when I was I think two or three, um, similar to you all. Um, and as an immigrant, there's sort of this pressure to be very ambitious and and all these other things. So, like putting my all into these books is like a personal thing to me. It's like I I'm, it's just such a pleasure, you know, to work on these books. Um, Pa's book in particular, um, basically from our first one or two meetings. So we we always have Zoom meetings and then we had an in-person meeting. Um, the three things that really stood out to me were your use of color and the use of black and white and color, like pairings. Uh That was so strong to me. I was like, oh my God, it's so amazing. Uh Um, The second thing that really informed the book was these strips that you make 
of I guess they're like more exhibition wall planning mm -hmm. than book making. Yeah. But we found one of these things online. I was like, oh my god, that's like so nice. Like, what if the entire book were thought of as like this giant exhibition wall? And that's what we set out to do. You know, to create this um, these kinds of like exhibition walls. Which became the actual layout of the book. So this is an exact miniature of the book. Like if you spread the book out, this is exactly what the inside of the book is. Um, so that the kind of strong pairing of color, which we really tried to play up. Like the inside of the book is purely black and white, mm -hmm. and then it's like really contrasted with this um, this backdrop, which I'll talk about later. So um, the backdrop in, in a lot of Pa's work, um, she, you use these, but do you want to talk about these backdrops? Yeah, maybe? yeah. So there's these, um, so I would say that like a studio portraiture came to Laos through the French colonization of Laos. And so that happened in like the 1940s, right? And so with the colonization of Laos, from French, the French folks also brought with them these studio, uh, like portrait uh, settings, right? And so oftentimes the backdrop will often be these um, painted moundscapes. Uh, and then, like, also throughout the years, it's like slightly shifted, right? So it went from these painted moundscapes to these valleys with mountains filled with uh, opium florals, um, opium fields, right? And so this, um, very similar to that. Um, uh, so the, 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 the vinyl or the cover of the book is actually a, uh, a, a backdrop uh, vinyl that uh, you all created yes. of, of an open field. Yes, yeah. So, um, so that, that was super fascinating. Um, I was really attracted to how these things looked. And then we were talking once, we're like, I was like wondering, like, how do you, like, who creates these? We, at yeah. first I thought that maybe you made them in no, Photoshop no. or something, but, but you were like, oh yeah, just people Photoshop them, yeah. you know, like whoever is the backdrop person, yeah. like Photoshop sees. And so um, we wanted to somehow incorporate that both materially and, and as a graphic for the book. So the first idea was that we're going to find one of these real backdrops you know, in, in Laos and like bring it back and somehow recreate it, but that, that we couldn't do that. So we took a portion of this, um, we put, took a portion of this backdrop here and we AI generated this eight by 10 foot back, this giant fake backdrop, which is sort of real, but fake. By the way, it's our <laughs> first AI book cover. Yeah, exactly. And I'm just going to say, you know, and, and a, no no threat to authorship. I hope you don't feel no, that. No, not it, at it, all. It is definitely not at all. The, the first time that we have been able to have AI play a role I love that. in the generation yes. of the cover. Wow. Um, I love uh, that. Noah Beckwith from my studio generated this I don't even but know Maybe how, actually how we should all do. hold ours up because yeah. Yeah. They, the, the thing that I so you may not be able to tell if you're, unless you're lucky enough to hold one of these books. But these covers that we're holding are, they are clearly, clearly vinyl. They have like the texture, they have that sort of plasticky feeling of like a picnic tablecloth. So they are, and they are all from, cut down, 32 different covers. Well, I'll let you talk about it, Alex. But uh, you, it, it's really, I think if you're sitting at home, the materiality, the smell of it, it like the minute you pick it up, it feels vinyl. You know, you you know you're holding something that's not a typical book cover. It feels yeah. like a backdrop. Yeah, yeah. It's it's real, real. it really is a it, backdrop. It is a it backdrop. Actually really yeah. is a backdrop. It's a material yeah. Yeah. for the backdrop. Yeah. 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 Um, shout out to Aperture production team. Um, oh yes. And the shout out in to Turkey. the Aperture yes. production Min team. Minji, um, Noah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, all of this coming together was kind of a dream to me like you know but wait like can you just go one more time so you 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 thought of uh, the, doing a backdrop how did you decide that you wanted to do 32 in other words there might have been other ways to do this with one cover that you so i will you yeah. talk a little bit more about the the process of like making it big and then cutting it down small i i just sure. love it 
It's limitations. Um, the backdrop machine, we asked the printer, like, what is your backdrop? You know, they print these giant backdrops from this kind of wide format, like Epson type printer. And so we were like, okay, how wide is your thing, your printer? And they were like, I can't remember, like eight feet wide. And, they were like, and you know, we based that um, on the maximum width and then we extended it 10 feet. So we made an eight by 10 foot backdrop because of the limitations of the actual backdrop machine. And then from there, we're like, okay, how many you know jackets can you, you know, cut out of this eight by ten foot thing? And that determined. It's just production, pure. But production. I mean, was the size of the book in in relation to the what you could do with the cover, or was that different? Not really. The size was determined pretty early on, mm -hmm. and then I think there was a little bit of waste, not not much. Yeah. Will you talk about the size? Yeah, it because is a very it, yeah. Intimate thing. Yeah, yeah, it feels like a sketchbook to me. You know. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. You know, I think like one of the very first questions. Leslie asked me was um, like, what photo books are you looking at? What do you like? And like, what- Can like, we say Leslie is Leslie Martin? Yes, Leslie who Martin, Who is yes. Aperture's editor right. at large, who's now the director of Printed Matter. Absolutely. So for the Leslie Martin fans among yeah. us, um, she has been a, oh. a an unbelievable presence right. in this. And Absolutely. I know an incredible guide for you through this book. Yeah, so. I mean, just it's been such a dream to be able to work with her and to have her help edit the book and I mean just a dream but you okay, know so she first asks you what kind of books do you like yeah what do you like and so I you know I also love photo books I love looking at them I love collecting them I love having them in my lap and you know I said to her I don't want something really big you know but also like I really like the Dina Lawson monograph but I also like this book called The Coast with like the sequencing um, and so like maybe like something in between you know like that is like a monograph and an artist book and you know I think it was um, and then also like really thinking about like well how do you envision you know, like, like, how do you envision this book? Like, is it a book that you set on the like coffee table? Is it a book that you can read in your bed? Is it a book that you that can like sit on your lap? And I think all those things are really important questions. Like for me, as like a lover of photo books and as somebody who likes to look at photo books, I want to be able to put it in my book bag and take it home or take it somewhere. And I want to like give it to my friend and I don't want it to be really heavy. I also want it to, you know, like there's some sort of like normalcy that I want with this mm -hmm. book. And I think like that, you know, made that very clear to both uh, Alex and uh, Leslie. And it, it was just like from there, it was just like, okay, like here's the things that we can do. And then um, I think the originally the book was gonna be a little bit smaller. You know, um, so what but, made you grow it from that? You know, that was a decision by Alex. Yeah, actually, it was it was just a little bit shorter. It didn't feel proportional or something. So we extended by an inch. It's just, it was yeah. like an inch taller. Yeah, no big deal. Yeah. yeah, but I think it makes a huge difference. Yes, proportion <laughs> is huge. It's no big yes. deal, but genius. Right. Yeah, <laughs> right. And well, I think you, in a lot of ways, the book really d does like encapsulate everything that I love about photo books and then also like everything that I really like about like photography or like working with like the materials you know there is this sort of very vinyl cover and then the inside of the book is this matte paper really beautiful matte paper and then this very glossy paper at the end I mean it's just like yeah. it's literally actually, like everything. let's talk we we may have brushed over that a little bit quickly and if you and Alex would speak to that. So the paper is as you're describing. The, all the pages, the plates, are on this mat. Then you get toward the end, and then you come to here. Which should we pause and talk about this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah. Well, no, no. Let's go through to what the yeah, back yeah, is yeah. like, and then we'll return to this. Um, so then you're on glossy paper, and I remember the first time I saw this, I I was like, what What is that? What are they thinking? So. Maybe Alex, you want to talk us through how the back matter? Yes. Which is like, and the color choices. Yeah, the color choices and. Yeah, the um, again, just trying to um, play up these things that I felt were already incredibly strong with Pa's work is the color, like the different, like the strong black and white photos or the strong color photos, like that pairing to me, was something that I really wanted to kind of expand on even. 
So the, the text pages are, um, are using all fluorescent um, Pantone colors, and they're referencing these traditional Hmong um, tapestries and clothing. And so it's just a small kind of reference to uh, things that are kind of related to um, Paul's past. And the, the, the choice of having the photos on uncoated paper is, is usually people print photos on coated paper because it, it's just a different kind of surface that has a higher fidelity and it has richer colors if you use coated paper. And, but I'm always really excited about printing photos on uncoated paper because to me they feel more, somehow they feel more alive or approachable or not stuck in, not kind of like stuck in time. Somehow they feel more alive. And then the choice of printing the text on glossy coated paper is sort of like reverse of what you would normally do if you had two paper types. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it was just, I'm happy that Paul was um, open to that idea. Oh yeah, and, absolutely. I mean, I love the, uh, the, the uncoated paper because in a lot of ways that's what I use for my own work too, is that like it's the matte paper, yeah. right? And it's the paper that I use to print work on, to look at, and so that made a lot of sense. I think that was very clear really early on that it was gonna be uncoated paper, right. you know? Right. And that was the one thing that I was like very sure on and that um, I wanted that. Yeah. Um, and so and Alex turned that into an opportunity to do that sort absolutely. of inversion. Absolutely. Of, of I have to life. say, as just being a part of the exhibition side of this award, um, this is so much your work, you know, and it and it's so nice to have a book that represents you as an artist and your practice mm. because the materiality is um, handled beautifully. The way you think about um, approaching the images, the mm. same as in the show where some are framed, some are not, some are on dye bonds, some are formal, and the lenticulars and the light box, and it's like. This, you're, you brought that practice in here, and in working together, you really got something that feels so much um, personal and a part of you and a reflection of your work, yeah. which is really nice. So maybe you want to talk about the way the cover picture is featured in the exhibition, which I, I actually, it's a great illustration of how something exists in a book one way and is encountered in a completely different way in an exhibition. So, yeah. So, um, or maybe you want to tell us the story of the can picture. I, yeah, yeah, can I yeah, tell the yeah. story? Yeah, tell the story. Um, so, uh, my uh, my grandmother uh, back in the refugee camps um, was um, uh, uh, had a had a granddaughter, uh, my oldest cousin, and her name is Pasal. And uh, Pasal's uh, mother died at birth, and so my grandmother uh, raised her. Um, and when my grandmother was going to come to the United States. Um, Pasal's father, my uncle, decided that uh, he would not uh, come to the United States. And so he and Pasal were going to go back to Laos, and my grandmother was going to come to the United States. And so my grandmother um, had uh, this photograph commissioned. And uh, the original photograph, which is the photograph at, at, on the very, in the very front, um, she, my grandmother had that photograph commission, and um, it lived with us. Uh, my grandmother came and stayed with my father. Uh, shortly after she came to the United States, she had a stroke and was immobilized, and uh, she, my father took care of her um, for all the years that she had lived. And um, when uh, and I, we and my cousins and I always knew that this was my grandmother's favorite picture, my grandmother's favorite grandchild, because it lived in every house that we ever lived in, and in her bedroom was this one single image that hung in next to her bed, and so we knew that this was her favorite grandchild. And um, when my grandmother passed away in 2011. I asked my father if I could have the photograph. My dad said, sure, and the photograph lived with me. And when I it moved into all the houses that I moved into, <laughs> and uh, one uh, Thanksgiving, my cousins had came over to my house for Thanksgiving dinner, and they had saw they saw this photograph um, in my hung up in my house, and we talked about it. And I think jokingly, I said, um, 
I said, yeah, like, we can all be, like, um, ball. Do they like, also acknowledge that this was your grandmother's favorite grandchild? Absolutely. So all like, the cousins have this in common. Everybody, there's we one all, favorite, and then there's the right, rest of you? Okay. Right, We all knew, right? Everyone so, except the favorite. Everybody except the favorite. <laughs> and so, but she didn't have to worry about that because no, she was the favorite. So. Exactly. And so, you know, when uh, I just jokingly said, oh, yeah, we can all be Paul's favorite grandchild grandchild and Paul is what we call uh, my paternal grandmother and so we so one I took a picture I made a photograph of all all of them and then went into Photoshop Photoshop all their faces Alex into the photograph them. and then uh, printed it out into the original eight by ten that I had and then uh, framed it and then gave it to everybody for Christmas um, and it became the, we all became my grandmother's favorite grandchild. Um, and but you know, if you didn't make it too perfect. In no, other no, words, no. Right. You I mean, that, the, the point was that it was not right. perfect. Right. Um, but you know, I think that uh, uh, you know, it, it, it was it was like very funny at the very beginning. But then I think also like there was something about it. You know, the 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 artifice, the, the, the history of the studio portraiture. You know, uh, the Photoshop, I mean, just like uh, so much history about that, ab ab about the, the, the history of this image and the history of photography within like the Hmong diaspora. Um, and then also like when this book was coming out, I had I like had like taken the book, took a picture of it, posted it up on Photoshop uh, on Facebook. And my my cousin, who is like in the cover, she the goes, favorite grandchild. She like, yes, she messaged me privately and she's like, uh, 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 uh what, why, what, what is this? How do you? <laughs> and I, I was like, oh, this is a photograph of you. Grandma had a commission. She's like, I don't remember. And I'm like, because of think... course she's in love. She's not here. You're, the rest of you were Absol dealing with this picture. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> and so she'd asked for the photograph to be sent to her. And so I made, you know, obviously made a, an eight by 10 and it's on her, it's a to her, but. Um, yeah, just like th th that, that image, I think, is um, in a lot of ways really important. Um, that group of images, for in a lot of ways, is very important in the way in which I think about photography, like my own practice, and how my practice like works and evolves, you know? And maybe, Jill, you'll speak a little to how, because it's the first work you encounter. Yeah. Well, we'll talk, there, there's another question from the audience about another work, but it is at least it's the first work to your right when you walk right, in. Do you right. want to talk a little bit about how yeah, you installed it? Yeah, I mean, I think that having that piece there and showing all nine of them where you have never seen that before, you only saw one or four of them, was an, a really great opportunity, and it connected so well to the cover of the book. But it, I feel like that work really embodies your approach to portraiture, um, this idea of photography as, you know, artifice mm -hmm. um, or, you know, fact or fiction. And then also your sense of humor, oh, which yeah. I, you know, hadn't really come across until I got to know you a little bit more. Yeah. And it really does come through in so much of your work that, yeah. and I think you and Tommy share that. Oh, thank you. Um, but, you know, having that piece kind of rooted the, the show and then walking through the rest, um, especially when we were talking about laying them out on those long lines. Mm -hmm. I would have to open them up on my computer and I'm like taking it all on. Right. I'm like printing it out in sections and taping it. And um, and it was really kind of like the, the show itself has a beautiful cadence and a beautiful materiality. And what I love about it is that, you know, it doesn't matter that the works are from different bodies of work. It's like a whole new kind of iteration and discussion and I think that that's what's so powerful with right. your work and having this as like a really strong solo show of you know the light box piece too as that backdrop which right. illuminates the rest is also really quite stunning and also looking at that landscape and having that landscape next to the one with the the boys taking a selfie mm -hmm. in Laos and looking at those two different landscapes but yet they're similar and in conversation right. but not and I just think that there's so many layers to this that when you when you first walk into the show and you walk through it, you you get the first round and then it hits you and you get a deeper mm -hmm. and then a deeper and you sit with it. And I think that that's really special about the way you approach your work and the way the, the work is approached in the book. It is the light box. So when you when you do walk into the exhibition, 
although the this picture is in a grid on the right, immediately when you walk in, the light box is, and actually that's a question from our audience, they've said, like, what made you use decide to use a light box for your photos? And maybe that's a good opportunity also to hear you speak about that series, because we haven't really talked about it in depth. Yeah, so um, that series is from a, a, a body of work titled Bakondu, um, which is uh, in English translates to Flowers of the Sky. And um, that is um, a, a body of work that I made in Northern California, um, in the Mount Shasta area, um, specifically photographing um, a, a subdivision full of uh, Hmong families that have moved to Northern California to cultivate marijuana. And I was not really, in, I was not interested in the cultivation of the marijuana. I was really interested in the landscape of that land and then also like the history of that land, the history of Hmong people, uh, you know, it, it was like, there was like all of these things that I was interested in. But before that, you know, I was, you know, I, I, I feel like I like have a very, traditional photographic upbringing. And what I mean by that is, you know, I studied Carlton Watkins, Enzo Adams, you know, Timothy O'Sullivan, right? Really thinking about these really great photographers that photographed uh, uh, the West, right? Uh, as a way to entice people to move westward. And I was really thinking about that when I was making that work in California. Um, and um, I thought about, well, okay, like, what apparatus are they using, if they were alive, could they be using to entice people to move westward? And the thing that keeps coming up is the light boxes, the light boxes um, at, uh, at the mall, the light boxes that are at the airport, and I really wanted to play on that idea, right, to use the light boxes as a sort of editorial object, right? And so, um, uh, I made the photographs, um, had the photographs uh, printed on this transparency paper. And there's something really seductive about the light boxes, the way in which the light boxes sort of seduce you in with the light and the way in which the images, right, this sort of larger than life image, the way it envelops you. And I really like like those ideas. And like, and so like that is the decision for the light boxes. That's awesome. And they're really sophisticated because you can dim them, so you can decide how mm. bright or you know right. low you want. And I think that that also works well with your decision making in terms of how much are you enticing, right. and how much do right, you want right. people to like mm. be seduced. Mm. <laughs> you have that control. Mm. Um, so there's one more audience question, which will revert back to this, and then I want to talk a little bit more about the exhibition and the book. And but the question is. Um, is the story of the photo of your cousin that you just told in the book? And if so, where did you decide to put it and why? And maybe this is a good way also of talking about the contributors to the book, because there, there really are um, yeah. four of like oh, the God. amazing, amazing contributions in the back. But despite the fact that one is pink and one is teal and one is purple, um, they really um, add to the stories that you're telling. So they're not just on glossy paper. They're... Yeah, um, yeah, so the story of my cousin is not in the book, but I think it's important to talk about the writers that have contributed to Great. the book. You know, so uh, Godfrey Lin is a, a Chinese um, Canadian uh, curator um, who, I met when I was in Minnesota, he was in Minnesota, um, who has really like uh, seen me grow as a photographer, as an artist. You know, um, I met really early on in my photographic career. Um, and then there's Kalkalia Yang, who is this amazing author. Um, you know, she wrote this really beautiful book um, called The Late Homecomer. Um, and there is, um, uh, what is it, Miter Yang, who is this amazing poet. Um, and then uh, uh, also Kong Peng uh, Pa, who is an amazing um, historian, author, teaches at University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. And then Audrey Sands, who uh, I met when uh, Tommy and I were at Yale, and she was getting um, her master's or PhD. PhD. She was getting her PhD. Writing on Lizanne Modell. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, you know, I, she worked. She and I worked at MoMA together. Too. Oh, I, so, oh, wow. Yeah, I'm okay. a huge fan of Audrey. Yeah, so. see, but she, you know, I mean, and she was there really at the very beginning. Would come to our crits, would have studio visits with us, and you know, I think she like as the years grew, we just continue to be friends and continue to keep in touch with each other. And so, I really, I mean, I feel like this list of writers and contributors, uh, like, is I, I mean. I mean, I've been saying it's like chef's kiss because it really <laughs> is like as an artist, um, as an artist, it's so important for other uh, people that look like you that have the same history as you to write about you, to understand the work. And like I, I feel I feel really fortunate that um, I've been able to work with them and that they've been, they've been able to contribute um, like uh, to the book. Um, I think they, they provide, you know, as a as a reader of the book you know i wasn't leslie really led this process so i came to it you know reading the proofs and seeing the designs and i agree the, these writers each bring so many points of access into your work um they they really they're wonderful contributions yeah. actually not unlike tommy's book but we'll <laughs> We'll say that. Another um, so maybe actually Tommy and Pop, because you've both been through this experience of you have a book, there's a, a selection of pictures that you've made and you've sequenced working with an editor and a designer, but then you get to do it in a different way in an exhibition. So maybe Tommy, you will go chronologically in this. <laughs> yeah. um, you talk a little bit about what that was like for you and Jill. Last, you can remember last year, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what is time? Um, <laughs> yeah, I really had um, such a humble, grateful experience working with Alex and Leslie and just a book process. And then by the time we were visiting the exhibition um, to plan for it, um, I think we're kind of just submitting the final draft for the book. And so I was able to like switch over to talking about the iteration of do we want to repeat um, and then we worked with Don Chan to came on board as a, a guest curator and mm -hmm. she did such a great job to order things and I like to not revisit the same kind of strands but kind of uh, sh kind of revisit in a different form and iteration that um, I had some more time with posts like uh, sequencing the book so mm -hmm. it was great to just like think about the pictures in the more physical format and then like playing around with like the form format and Jill, everyone at Baxter Street, Sydney, um, Jesse just were so great to work with and to realize that, um, yeah. And you had actually had an exhibition. We, we made a little bit of an exception for you because we like your work so much, but you had actually, so maybe Jill, you want to talk about what, what was it that persuaded all of us that it was okay well, yeah, or, I mean, yeah. Baxter Street's mission is to give um, underrepresented, you know, um, underserved artists their first opportunity for a solo show. And so we have our residency program, our guest curated program, um, partnerships with Young Arts, Aperture, Stoneleaf. And so with Tommy, he, he was a resident. Mm. Um, but as I explained earlier in the hour, the way that the process was that was nominated, he was nominated so many times mm -hmm. by so many different people. It didn't, you know, Baxter Street didn't feel like they could say, well, just because he had a show here, he's he's disqualified because then that's not really fitting to our mission either. So it was a challenge, but we all discussed it and felt like, you know, that next step, which is the, you know, kind of spirit of this award is getting to, you know, help artists at pivotal moments in their career. And this was one of those for Tommy. So it felt like partnering him with a curator that could really help his, you know, discourse and discuss like how he wanted to position himself in this work and in this new space and approach it in a different way I felt like that was a new step. And so that's how we kind of came about that um, decision. And I think that it was really wonderful because it was a very, I mean, I wasn't there during your residency show, but um, it seems like it's two really different bodies of work. and. What's interesting, there's something to be said about Tommy really knew the space because he had intimate knowledge of it prior. And so I think that that really helped elevate his his practice too. And, you know, Baxter Street's there to like open up 
you know, the gates and not have any constraints in any, like there's no commercial, you know, value in any of it. It's just really like an arts incubator. So like, let's use this and really experiment. And I think that that you, you did that and you did that as well yeah. with, um, you know, bringing in this huge light box. And, <laughs> it is you know, the biggest light box you've ever had in this space. It really right? has. <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, we even had like a whole Zoom call dedicated to how to install it, which was really great to have. Um, but I think that even like with the lenticulars and really thinking about, you know, the framed work and unframed and the dye bond and, you know. Well, can we actually pause on each of those? Because they're all so interesting. And I, I think that's one of the striking things, thinking of the difference between, yeah. you know, on a book you're talking glossy, you know, coated and uncoated paper. Mm -hmm. But you made so many different decisions about how to display the work. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that comes with, like, really thinking and about... And maybe people don't know some of these words also, I was yeah. thinking. Uh, yeah, so like that yeah. that idea really comes from the sort of really thinking about, I mean, I was really thinking about materials and like even accessibility and, you know, like historically the photograph is behind a window and like, I mean, it's behind glass, it's in case, right? And there's something about, uh, about that, right? Mm -hmm. That feels really photographic. Um, and then also, like, there's something about, I think about the lenticular and how sometimes, like, how kitsch that can be. And So like, what is a lenticular? You know, for somebody who doesn't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so a lenticular is a flat 2D image that gets, uh, like, brought in. Tommy, you might want to know this. <laughs> gets brought in to Photoshop gets chopped up into well, can a I, right, can, I, can I give a little historical? Yeah, like, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, please. It, be, long, please. Before, long before Photoshop, there were lenticular photos. Mm. And what it was was if you took two photographs from slightly different points of view and you layered onto them something that allowed you to see from some angles one of the pictures and from, a, it's almost like a screen right. that's laid over it. And it's ridged when you scrape your finger. And so it's the illusion of movement, of depth, when you go. So now they can do it, I, I presume, with Photoshop. But it is, it's a really historic, a little bit like, um, yeah, it's a historic analog process that, yeah. that I. Yeah, it was trying to break the barriers. Gifts. Yeah, the barriers of the single image. Right. And so I think that like, that was groundbreaking at the time. Yeah, yeah. and I think like, like it's like mostly associated with like kids. You know, I feel yeah. like, yeah, I feel like even now, like, like you don't see it often. No. The only time you see it is when you're at, like, a kid's store and you're, like... There's actually, you know what, there's a postcard right behind you, Jill. Um, I have, I happen to love lenticular. I, uh, yeah, same. <laughs> and I so love. if you just scratch your fingernails across it, you can sort of... Oh, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, I was, like, really interested in that and thinking about you know, the the idea of illusion, mm -hmm. right? Um, and space in a flat 2D um, image. And I think like the lenticular for me made the most sense in like sort of creating that um, illusion. I also really love like the idea of like just having an image on the wall, right? That doesn't have anything to encase the image, mm -hmm. you know? And then also like really thinking about like the light box and the way in which um, the light box like works as like this sort of uh, like avatorial object, right? And so, um, yeah, I was really thinking about, you know, what that other illusion could potentially look like in an exhibition. And then there are some pictures that are quite traditionally mounted in frames. So how do you choose which ones are treated like that? Yeah, well, they they're from different bodies of work, mm -hmm. right? I, so right? Like they're these. I, I mean, this right, is a sincere right, right. question. No, 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 How did you choose which one? Well, yeah, I, I asked you. There's two pieces. There's um, the black and white flower, uh -huh. and then the um, the girl the on the, girls, the yeah. yeah. And those two are not a diptych, but you hang hang them in pairs. Uh -huh. And I had asked why um, did you photograph the flowers in black and white, mm -hmm. except there's one mm -hmm. in that series that's color. Right. And so I was like, how do you make those choices? Yeah, I mean, and you know, and so the way in which those decisions are made, oftentimes it's like, it's like the photographer's discretion, mm -hmm. right? But also like really thinking about, like, I, you know, I was really thinking about, uh, for me, when I was 
photographing the still lives of these fake flowers, you know, I was like thinking about like, like Dutch paintings, these still life paintings that are like really dramatic and, you know, wanting to make uh, like these still lives like in, 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 in the, in, in the light of these uh, Dutch paintings. Right. And so that, yeah, um, that was like really, was really, really important that they, that that was this sort of uh, black and white. Um, and then the color, uh, the red, the red backdrop with the bamboo, I think that's the image that you're referring to, right? Um, you know, that, for me, like that red and that green, like the way in which those two colors like are like right next to each other. I don't think that's in the book. It's not in the book. Okay. But the way in which those two <laughs> we, colors, well, I was like, I was like, I see three people flipping yeah, for it. I'm it's gonna not just in say, I'm gonna make. Yeah, people. but the way in which those colors like. It's a good re another yeah. good reason to go see this show. Absolutely. Sorry, well, we, we, we were saying the, we did the, talk about that too, yeah. but we yeah. can get back to that. Yeah, but the way in which those <laughs> colors like pair right up next to each other. You know, I think like for me, like, like I just like you know again like really thinking about like the photographer's discretion and like in like how do like how how can how can an image like move you in a way? And I think it was really important that that um, that that red uh, backdrop and the the fake bamboo lucky. I think it's called Lucky Bamboo, mm -hmm. you know, that my mother bought from the dollar store that you could still maybe see the tag, price tag the 99 yeah. cent price tag. And then if you look closely enough, you could see all the dust that was on, like that are on the uh, um, uh, the, the plant, right? Like, like that was really important that it was like yeah. in color. Um, so it's amazing. We're getting close to an hour, but I think it would be interesting. We, we've never had two artists um, on the Photo Book Club before. And I think in honor of this award, you know, do you have any advice? Because we, we do have a lot of um, photographers who listen in both live and watching it later. Do you have any, you have any advice for photographers who are thinking about making this next step or, you know, anything yeah, you want to I mean, share? I, I, so I teach at a university and I always tell my students slow and study mm -hmm. and be obsessed about the thing that you're making. Um, and I think like that is, that is the advice that I give over and over again. It's an advice that I've given to Tommy. It's an advice that Tommy has given to me. It's just slow and study. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think community and working with um, people who are supportive or speaking the same language as you uh, to surround yourself and then have each other text text each other like it's gonna be okay even if you're not on yes yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but keep going because there's like a world of uh, no's I don't want to say rejection but those things happen but to um, really uh, continue the work because that is uh, something that none of us can do. It's like we are doing our own work and and to uh, through the frustration and pleasure of it, it is worth uh, just continuing and seeing the work through. Yeah, yeah. And Jill is an artist, so I think she understands that. I'm yeah. not an artist, and I still have a deep sense of respect for like the vulnerability of making something and putting it out there in the world. So I, that idea of community feels. And I, I do want to add to Tommy's about just this idea of rejection, because I know you applied to the residency for like seven, seven, eight, mm -hmm. seven eight times. And to your point, Bob. And look, and look where he is <laughs> yeah. now. And I think that, you know, we change our juries every year. So it's, there were seven different juries looking at his work and watching it develop. And I think that, you know, and the perseverance and slow and steady and it wasn't your time or you weren't ready or whatever the reasons, but you just gotta keep keep moving, mm -hmm. keep yeah. going. And if you are obsessed with it, it, it comes through in the work. So there was one last question that came in. I would I would wrap it up, but I feel out of fairness to somebody who's asking a really a nice question and speaks to why I decided to wear this dress tonight too, which is could you talk a little bit about your feelings about flowers in your book? Because you, you do speak beautifully to this. So, and this uh, person is saying the sky and flowers are a very important part of their yeah. life. And so that seems, although I, would, I liked the next step idea, but why don't we end on that? 
Yeah, so the flower for me is really important. And I think it's because it's also it was really important for my mother. You know, so my mother, when she first came to the United States, uh, when we would go through the checkout, she would pick up these Martha Stewart um, like uh, 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 magazines and she would look at them and it would always be these like Martha Stewart like these like very beautiful bouquets of flowers and she I think that. she like like in her in, in, in her thinking like to be an American is to have the sort of like the, the flower in the living room the flower in the kitchen the flower in the bathroom the flower in the bedroom and so all my life I've been like surrounded by fake flowers mm -hmm. not real flowers my mother <laughs> was never able to afford real flowers but fake flowers and so I've been surrounded by fake flowers my entire life um, also going to Southeast Asia and realizing that there's this huge like uh, like fake floral industry more so than there are like real flowers you know and that was like really wild for me too to like to like to witness that um, and so like I think like the, like the flower has always been like very important uh, for me in my life I think it reminds me of my mother it reminds me of this idea of the American dream um, but also like I think about like the like the plastic of the flower right like it is always like this the, fl the, the fake flower is always this sort of really beautiful like full bloom flower it's plastic so it never uh, like wilts it never deteriorates it, it's like it doesn't shrink it doesn't go away it doesn't do anything it just gets it just, dusty it, it gets dusty <laughs> yeah. right but it stays forever and there's something about that that I think um, that, that I think I'm really like drawn to, you know? Um, and so, yeah, well, that's thank the flower. You. That, that's a great way to end. Yeah. So thank you to our wonderful guests. We really loved having you. Hope you had fun. Um, thank you to Photo Focus for making all of this possible. Thank you to Leslie Martin. Let's just do Absolutely. a little, oh my God. Um, not here, but here in spirit. And thank you to the amazing teams behind you, you know, um, as the four of us will, five of us will attest to Clark and Candle Productions, to Brianna and Alex and Noah, who is not only here helping, but also was a huge, played a huge role in this book. So to Noah Lynn, thank you too. And, um, you know, to the, to Baxter Street and the 7G and the Next Step Award. Um, Absolutely. I love hearing about what this has meant for you both. And if you haven't seen the show yet, which might be difficult because it just opened yesterday, it's on view at Baxter Street through March 20th. So run, don't walk. And um, thanks all. Have a good night. <laughs> yeah, by the way, everybody, um, Jill, mm -hmm. would you like a glass of wine now? Maybe, yeah. I was told not to move. I'm not going to move. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <don't, laughs> I don't want to.